Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter number 46 tonight. Genesis chapter number 46, the summary would be Jacob going down and reuniting with his son Joseph. That's going to be the overall theme of the chapter there. We're going to see some genealogies and we'll dive into that a little bit. There's some controversy about some numbers and everything, so we're going to take a look at that tonight. Uh, Genesis chapter number 45 was where Joseph had made himself uh, manifest or known, his true identity that is, to his brethren. And uh, once he had done that, you know, they finally reunited. And uh, he then sent them back to tell his father and, uh, and everyone else back in the land of Canaan uh, that he was alive. And for them to come down and to live with him and that he was going to take care of them, he was going to provide for them. And that they didn't need to bring anything. And here in Genesis chapter number 46, verse number 1, we're going to begin when uh, J Jacob, excuse me, Jacob is actually moving down. He's, he's in the middle of his trip coming down to uh, the land of Egypt, to Egypt. Look there in verse number 1, Genesis 46, verse 1. The Bible says, And Israel, of course that's Jacob, that's his new name. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba, and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. So I want to stop right there and go back to Genesis 21, verse number 31. So it's important, there's a reason why the Holy Ghost mentions these sites. And there is a significance with these different locations and these cities and things. And uh, we're told why these, these different places are called, what they're called. So we need to have some familiarity with these locations. So here in Genesis 21 is actually where uh, this site is first discussed and actually where the name is given to it, uh, calling it Beersheba. So I, as I said, Genesis 21, look with me at verse number 31. This is where the title is given. Let's get the context here. You can back up. Uh, look at verse number 27. It says this, And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, what mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. So they're making a covenant one with another. They have been striving previously about the wells, if you remember this story when we went through it. And right now he's, he's giving him you know, this token for this covenant, right? This is going to be so that they're at peace with one another and he's claiming this well for himself. He's saying this is going to prove that I dig this well. Now look at verse number 31. It says this, Wherefore, so because of that, he called that place Beersheba, because there they swear both of them. You get an idea of what the word Beersheba means. It tells you there because. Just like when it tells you that they called him Jesus. Why? What was the reason? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. Which means Savior, right? Jehovah saves. So here we get an idea of what Beersheba means. And it tells you because there they swear both of them. So it has to do with the covenant and that both of them agreed to this covenant and they both swear or promised. So this is the location that when Jacob is traveling to Egypt, he's of course going to be going through the land of Philistia, right? Philistia, and he's going to be traveling and seeing the Philistines, right? In that area, going through the people of the Philistines. They lived there. That's why Abimelech was there. Uh, he was the king of the Philistines at that time. And he stops at Beersheba, which was a site that had significance where his father had digged this well and all of that. He had lived, Abraham that is, his grandfather. He stops there and it says that he offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. Verse number 2, And God spake unto Israel in the visions of night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here am I. Now that is a common way in which God will come to a man in a dream or in a vision. He does this, of course, to Samuel. He does this numerous times. And when the word of the Lord comes to a man, it comes in a vision or in a dream, right? And that's why they are called seers. This would be prophets. So Jacob here is classified, of course, as a prophet. God comes to him, it says, in a vision. And it says, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. So he responds back to God within this vision or within this dream. So it's interesting seeing how this actually operates. He's able to communicate with him. Just like when Peter communicated with God when he came and he, he had the net and he told him to eat all of the animals right and not to call anything common or unclean. 
Peter was able to communicate back and forth with God there, as is Jacob here when God comes to him. Within the dream, he speaks back to God, which is very interesting. So Jacob could be qualified as a prophet because a prophet is what? It's a seer. It's someone that sees the word of the Lord. And that's why it says God spake unto him. That's the word of, the word of God or the word of the Lord in the visions of the night. And said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. So notice how Jacob, <coughs> excuse me, notice how Jacob is quick to respond. He's attentive, isn't he? He's attentive to the word of God. Just as when God came to Samuel, Samuel answered, didn't he? Here am I, right? Abraham, it reminds me of when Abraham was on uh, Mount Moriah. He was offering Isaac. What does he say when the angel calls out to him? Here am I, right? So notice how he is attentive. He knows the word of the Lord. That's important that we know the word of God. We need to be familiar with the word of God when we hear it. Go to verse number 3. Verse number 3, and, and he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. So there's a couple of interesting things in these couple of verses here. Uh, number one, notice how he says, fear not to go down into Egypt. Now, there's a couple of reasons that you can make application on why he would be fearful. Number one, because he's going to a foreign country. That's one reason why he could be fearful. Number two, not only is that a foreign country, Egypt that is, but it is a dynasty. It is an empire that's very powerful, wherein they had had a little bit of issues before where, you know, a brother had been arrested, they'd been accused of things. Of course, they found out it was Joseph, but even still, they had controversy in Egypt. And Egypt is, is, was an, a huge empire. It was something to be feared, of course. Not only that, he says, fear not to go down into Egypt. And then he says, for I will there make of thee a great nation. Now, this may feel contradictory to uh, Jacob here because... What has Jacob been, you know, what is Jacob known for? What is, what is Jacob known for? What is it? He's the father of the nation of Israel. He is Israel, right? He is, you, know, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the nation is referred to by, it's classified by his name. Israel. And what is Israel known for? They were given the promised land. The covenant was made with them. The covenant was made with Abraham. It was given to Isaac. And then it was given to Jacob. What covenant? What is the covenant? The covenant that they would possess the land of Canaan. Now, this is why that would seem contradictory to him because Jacob himself had received this covenant, hadn't he? This covenant, this blessing was passed down to him and now he's being told after he had, he had never owned any of the land. He was still a stranger, it tells you in Hebrew, the book of Hebrews. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were intense and they were just sojourners. They never owned a plot of the land in uh, Canaan or in you know, the, the promised land, right? And now he's being told, hey, I want you to leave. While he's in his old age, I want you to leave and I want you to go down to Egypt. Doesn't that sound contradictory? Doesn't it sound like, hey, I thought I was going to be possessing this land. I thought I was going to be re receiving this land as an inheritance. Isn't that the covenant that you made with me? So God's telling him, hey, fear not to go down into Egypt. Because you can see why he'd be hesitant. Like, aren't I supposed to be receiving this land? Isn't, isn't the, the promise given to me that I'm going to possess this land? He says, for I will there make of thee a great nation. So notice he says, for. So he's, he's reestablishing, hey, don't be afraid to go down there as if I'm not going to fulfill my covenant. He says, for I will there make of thee a great nation. Saying, I'm still going to fulfill my covenant. So the overall application and the primary reason why he's telling him not to be afraid is because this may feel like, hey, you told me that you were going to be giving me this land. I was supposed to be receiving this covenant, but he's reestablishing and saying, hey, when you go down there, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And of course, this comes to fruition because when they go down into Egypt, what happens? They multiply greatly, don't they? They multiply greatly, which is, of course, the immediate application. The full application is fulfilled in those going to the New Jerusalem, right? So it says there, For I will there make of thee a great nation. And then verse 4, very interesting, with everything I said in mind, verse 4 says this, I will go down with thee 
into Egypt. So notice he says, I'm going to be going with you. He's saying, I'm not going to forsake you. Don't feel like you're leaving my will when you go to Egypt, right? Don't feel like you're, you're stepping outside of my will. I'm telling you to go there, and there I'm going to fulfill my covenant. I'm going to make of you a great nation, and I'm going to go down with you. So he's, he's, he's giving them this promise, you know, like God tells us in the New Testament, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's saying, I'm going to go with you. What happens with Joseph? Even when Joseph is, number one, thrown into prison, right? And then later on, you know, well, he's, he's given into slavery, to be specific. He's, he's in slavery, and then he's falsely accused, and then thrown into uh, prison. What does it tell him, what does it, what does it say about Joseph's state and his relationship with God when he's in slavery? Do you remember the phrase that I pointed out two times in that chapter? It says, number one, but the Lord was with him, right? The first time, but the Lord was with him. It talks about him being sold into slavery, speaks of his negative you know, uh, uh, situation and circumstances. It says, nevertheless, the Lord was with him. Then later on, everything seems to be, to, to, to be getting better, doesn't it? It seems like he's starting to become successful. You know, everything is just going his way. God's blessing him. But then he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And then he's taken and thrown into prison, isn't he? It seems like then he's just gone all the way back. Now he's, everything was already bad anyways. He still was in you know, a, a foreign land, had been betrayed by his brethren. He can't see his father, right? And then he's thrown into prison on top of it after that, right? When things seemed like they were getting better. You know what it says? Well, the Lord was with him. Now, even when Jacob's going down, what does God tell Jacob? He says, I will go down with thee into Egypt. Notice that. Those that are saved, those that are God's children, God will always be with us. Just like when Noah and his sons and their wives got on the ark, what does it say? It says that God was with them, right? It says that God shut the door of the ark and he opened the ark, right? He, was, he, told, he told them, he told Noah, come forth into the ark. And then he told them to go off of the ark. Why? Because God was with them the entire time. Those that are God's children, God will never leave you. Even when we get into sin, even when we live a wicked life, which is obviously horrible, we shouldn't you know, uh, uh, go out and sin against God. We should keep his commandments. But even if you did, God still would never leave you. You know, we're told that the comforter, he says that he's going to give us the comforter, and it says that he may abide with you forever, never leaving you, forever. He's going to give you another comforter, and he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us, right? He'll be with us forever. Just like in this situation, when he's going down into Egypt, which seems to be a dark place, doesn't it? It's called the land of bondage. It's the picture of the world. And he's going into Egypt, and he's telling them, hey, fear not. And then he tells them on top of that, he says, I will be with you. Even when we're in dark places in our life, even when maybe we get you know, sold into slavery, we're in prison, right? Things are going bad for us. God is still with us. God is still there. We can always still turn to God and we can find peace in the Lord. Whatever hard time you're going through, maybe someone close to you passes away, whatever it may be. You know, you know, we, we all have downs in our life. We all have problems that occur in our lives, right? One thing that can, you can always rely on that never changes is God will always be there. And He's never changing. He's just as solid as He was before. He's a firm foundation that you can always rest upon. He's never wavering. So it's, 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 uh, you know, it's comforting to know He's going with us. You go into Egypt, He will be there. You get thrown into prison, He's there with you. Look at what it says next. It says this, And I will also surely bring thee up again. Notice that. And I will also surely bring thee up again. Now, what was I saying in verse 3? Why did he tell him, fear not to go down into Egypt? Well, the reason was because he knew that uh, Jacob would be hesitant because of the covenant. Because he, Jacob, is well aware that that covenant has been established with him and that he has been told and he believes God. Even when things seem contradictory, he, he believes God. But God tells him, hey, fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. Right? And then he goes on and says, I will go down with thee into Egypt. And he says, I will also surely bring thee up again. What's he saying? I'm going to fulfill my covenant. I'm going to fulfill my covenant. Don't think that this is you know, me not being faithful. Don't think that the way that everything has worked, worked out, that now I'm just going to say, hey, maybe it's just best for you to go there. I'll give this land to somebody else. I'll give my covenant. I'm just going to take my covenant and give it to somebody else. You just go down into Egypt. No, he's saying... Go ahead and go. You know, this is my will. I want you to go. And then he reaffirms the covenant and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation in Egypt. And then he tells him, I'm going to bring you up again. Now, does Jacob get brought up again? 
He does. They carry him up, right? Joseph goes and they bury him, right? And uh, also, if you remember, Joseph gets carried and he's, he's buried there, right? But there's also a, a secondary application to this because what does that land really represent? Is that the true promised land over you know, in the Middle East? Is that, is that where you're just dying to move is to the Middle East right now? You can't wait you know, until you get to the Middle East? Of course not. It's New Jerusalem in heaven. That's the true promise. Those are just, the, you know, that land over there, you know, uh, when it was in its glory, of course, it was just a picture of the true land, but it was still never. It wasn't even close. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them. That's not even, that could never be compared unto the true Jerusalem which is in heaven. It never could be, right? So that's where the true covenant and the true promise lies is in the new Jerusalem. So notice what he says to him again. I will go down with thee into Egypt. And he says, and I will also surely bring thee up again. That's a, that is a promise that he's going to bring him up again. You know, he is going to bring him up again. Just like he's going to bring Joseph up again. Just like he's going to bring Jacob up again. You know what's going to happen? They're going to be resurrected. And then they're going to be brought back to that land. That's when that true covenant will, will truly and really now, you know, and fully be fulfilled is when we actually set foot into New Jerusalem. That's when the promise will be, f be fulfilled to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. He may not understand that fully right now. And this is why you have to believe God anyways. When God gives you a commandment and maybe it doesn't make sense, and you're like, man, I don't think this is best for my situation or where I'm at in my life. I don't think that this is just going to work out very well. I, this actually fe doesn't feel right to me. You know, I don't think that that's right for me or whatever it may be. Because everybody always says in their personal lives that I don't think that this is going to work out for me. Or maybe this doesn't feel right even. Maybe right when you get into Christianity, you know, you may hear something in the Bible and you're like, that just doesn't sound right. But you know what you need to do? You need to trust in the Lord. You need to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Wouldn't it be easy for Jacob here to lean on his own understanding and to say, I'm not going down into Egypt. God told me he's going to give me this land. Doesn't it make more sense for me just to stay here and wait for God to give me this land? Wouldn't that make more sense, you know, just commonly to your own wisdom, to man's wisdom? But that wasn't God's plan, was it? So if you rely upon your own wisdom and your own logic and your own philosophies and, and your own you know, wisdom, you know, you're going to be wrong. That's why you just need to believe God. You need to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. So you can see why in this situation, why Jacob would have been wrong if he went with what probably made the most sense to him. That's the whole reason why God came to him and said, fear not to go down into Egypt. Because he understood why he might be hesitant. Now, if he just trusted in God, he would understand once you get, of course, to the New Testament. Now that he's in heaven, he knows. You get to the, we get to the New Testament, it makes perfect sense to us, doesn't it? Because we see that the true promise is in heaven. And he is going to bring him up again. And he's going to take him over there. The dry bones, right, in the book of Ezekiel. He's going to raise up Israel. And then they're going to possess the gates of Jerusalem one day. They're going to get to go into to heaven, right? And that covenant will be fulfilled. So sometimes... When, you know, God's commandments, God's will, you know, all that may not make sense to you. But you know what? It doesn't have to. God's ways are much higher than our ways. His wisdom is much higher than ours. You just need to be obedient to God. How many times in the Bible did you read something and it didn't feel right? It didn't make sense to you? It felt like it contradicted? You know, uh, you, just, you just didn't understand it, but then you kept reading, you kept studying, and you're like, man, I was wrong. What an idiot I was. You know, I totally misunderstood this other passage that completely shed light on that passage, right? You know, I can't tell you how many times that things like that has happened. Imagine, imagine being the Pharisees, right? You know, don't, you know, obviously that's not good. Don't put yourselves literally in their shoes, but um, imagine how, the, how for the Pharisees it worked out when, uh, you, know, they, you know, they're waiting for Elijah, supposedly, which they don't believe in Moses. They don't believe in the Old Testament either. But imagine just being an Israelite. That's probably a better example. Imagine being an Israelite and John the Baptist comes and he's preaching and people are asking like, Art thou Elias? And he answered, no. Right? And they're like, well, Elijah's supposed to come next. Doesn't that kind of seem contradictory? And then you hear Jesus say, hey, this is Elias, if you will receive it. You're like, how do I, you know what you need to do? You just trust in the Lord. You just trust in God, right? And of course, you know, there's, there's two applications to it. You know, Jesus, you know, that's why the Israelites, this is totally off topic, but I, just because I brought it up, I have to explain it quickly. 
You know, one of the, the, the things that the disciples and the Israelites kept wondering is when is the kingdom coming, right? And what do you mean you're going to die, be buried, and rose again? We thought that this was the Christ, right? And, the, and that he was going to be the king of Israel. Well, they didn't understand that he was going to, he had two comings and that he was going to die, be buried, raise again from the dead, and then he was going to come back a second time where he rules with a rod of iron, where he fulfills all of those commandments that they didn't understand. The first time is his spiritual coming where he spiritually defeats death. He spiritually conquers death. And John the Baptist was a spiritual, a spiritual first coming of Elias. He came in the spirit of Elias. Well, next time is the physical coming. And he physically came the first time as well. But physical as in where he rules with force is what I'm saying, right? He's going to physically conquer. The first time was a spiritual conquering. The second time when Jesus comes will be a physical conquering. And guess who shows up before then too? a physical appearance of Elijah and Moses. So you see how it makes sense that there was actually a misunderstanding when you study the Bible? It makes perfect sense. How some things on the surface may not make that, may, may not make sense to you. But then when you learn more, you grow in the Bible, you, you, know, you grow in God's wisdom, it can make perfect sense later. You see why when you read this, when God's speaking to Jacob, why Jacob could be hesitant. But you read the whole book, you understand that that's not the, the true Israel as far as that land. The true Jerusalem, the true covenant is not that land over there. It's actually heaven. So when he's telling him he's going to raise him up again, right? He says, he's gonna, I, he says I, and I will also surely bring thee up again. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about he's going to put him in that land, like the, the true Israel, the true Jerusalem. And it says, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Verse number 5, And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, and their little, little ones, and their wives, in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. So now we're going to begin reading here in verse number 8, and this is going to be the genealogy all the way until technically verse 25. So we're going to read all the way down to verse 25. Um, actually, yeah, we'll do a quick pause at 25, read 26 and 27. I'm going to explain to you what the controversy is, what people you know, are confused about in these numbers, and then I'm going to give you why one of them is, one of these theories is for sure wrong, and I'll explain to you and show you why, and then I'll show you what I believe on the discrepancy, the, the supposed discrepancy in the numbers. So here, verse number 8, we're going to begin reading it. It says in Genesis, Genesis 46, 8, And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanak and Phalu, and Hezron and Carmi, and the sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jacob and Zohar, and Shaul, and the son of a, uh, the son of a Canaanitish woman, and the sons of Levi, Gershon, and Kohath, and Mirari, and the sons of Judah, Ur, and Onan, and Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul, and the sons of Issachar, Tola, and Puva, and Job, and Shimron, and the sons of Zebulon, Sered, and Elon, and Jalil. Uh, these be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob and Padanaram, with his brother, with his daughter, sorry, with his daughter Dinah. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three. And the sons of Gad, Ziphion, and Haggai, and Shunai, and Esbon, Eri, and Arodi, and Areli, and the sons of Asher, Jimna, and Ishua, and Isua, and Beriah, and Sarah, their sister, and the sons of Beriah, Heber, and Melchiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah his daughter. And these she bare unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin. And unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela and Beker and Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, and Rosh, and Mupim, and Huppim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel, which were born to Jacob. All the souls were fourteen. And the sons of Dan, Husham, and the sons of Nephali, Jaziel, and Gunai, and Jezer, and Shillam, 
These are the sons of Bilhah, which Laban gave unto Rachel his daughter, and she bare these unto Jacob. All the souls were seven. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons, wives, all the souls were threescore and six. I said I was going to stop in the previous verse. I'm going to keep reading verse number 27. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. Now, of course, it's giving you the genealogy because they're all moving down. They're, tran they're, they're, they're all moving. The, all these families are relocating from the land of Canaan where they're at right now, which is going to be future Israel, and they're locating to Egypt, right? So all of the genealogies are given here, and it's giving you numbers, and then it gives you the total numbers two times. And that's what I want to focus on, where the supposed discrepancy is. And as I said, I'm going to give you the first theory, and then I'm going to show you why that cannot be correct to try to reconcile this. And then I'm going to tell you my theory. And then I'm going to show you a passage, I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, that makes it even more confusing. So look here in verse number uh, 26. It says this, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons, wives, all the souls were three score and six. Now how much is three score and six? How many is that? That's 66, right? Three score and six is 66. Okay, so notice what it said. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's son's wives, they're eliminated. All the souls were, six, were three score and six, so 66. Now verse 27, it says this. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, now it says this, were three score and ten. So how much is that? That's 70, right? Three score and ten. So we have 66 and then we have 70. 66 and 70. So people try to reconcile these numbers. What's the difference in these two sets of numbers? Well, I'll tell you one, this is the most common. This is, I, I'm almost positive I remember. I definitely was taught this. And I think it also said it in a Schofield reference Bible because I had a Schofield reference Bible the first you know, few times that I read through the Bible and really started studying the Bible on my own. And I would read the notes. Normally when I started over in Genesis, I would read some of the notes. I didn't read them very often, but in Genesis I would read the notes. And I'm almost positive, especially if you, you know, if, if I run into like uh, something that was puzzling, I'd go to my notes to see like, hey, to Schofield, like, you know, he's a real spiritual giant that I can look to, right? I'd go to my notes to see what kind of explanation that Schofield had. And I'm almost positive that he, I know I've heard this from a few places, and I think he also taught this. So, 66 and 70. So there's four difference there, right? So a lot of people, of course, you'll, 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 you'll notice, number one, Joseph. So let's do that. Joseph, number one. And how many sons did Joseph have? Two. Manasseh and Ephraim. So now we're missing one, right? So what is the fourth? And this is the most popular way to reconcile these numbers. They say Jacob. Jacob is the fourth and it looks good when they just read verse number 26. Because it says this, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins besides Jacob's sons, wives, all the souls were three score and six. So it sounds like, well, that's talking about all the souls that came with him, so it makes sense that it's not including him there, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's saying he's counting all the souls that are with him. So it's saying these 66 do not include Jacob, right? Is everyone following me, right? So if we, when we get to 70, to try to reconcile that number, we have Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim, and maybe now they're counting Jacob. That makes sense, doesn't it? You get to number 70, it says, or, or verse number 27, it says this, And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. So it says there, all the souls uh, of the house of Jacob. Is that how it's worded? All the souls of the house of Jacob. So you could word it that way and still say, hey, maybe that is saying that now it's including Jacob. Because, of course, the Baker house, I'm a part of the Baker house, right? So you would include me as a number under that, right? Well, go to Exodus chapter 1. This is where you run into the issue. Exodus chapter number 1. And why I don't believe that that's how you reconcile this. Exodus chapter number 1, 
Look at verse number 5. Notice what it says here when it's, and it's restated. It says, And all the souls, watch this, that came out of the loins of Jacob. So is this including Jacob? Did he come out of his own loins? Of course not. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. So this number 70 right now, it obviously is aligning up with what we saw before. Can you... You know, include Jacob in this number 70? It's not possible. This is, that's the most common answer to that that I just gave you, is that now let's just throw Jacob in the mix. Well, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, we can see when the 70 number is given, it's definitely still not including Jacob. So Jacob, yes, he's not included in the 66 number, but he's also not included in the 70 number because this is just the people that came out of his loins. I'm going to further prove this to you by two more Scriptures. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. I think I have this right. I may not be going to the right place. You might have to look this up because I definitely want to look at this. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 10. Yeah, verse 22. Thy fathers went down into Egypt, it says, with three score and ten persons. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven from multitudes. So now we see the number 70 repeated again, right? Okay, go back to, to Genesis chapter number 46. Now you, 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 you may have noticed this before and you may not. This is actually this shows the simplicity of the Bible. I want you to look at verse number 15. It says, these be the sons of Leah, right? Then it goes through the list. Look at the very end of it. We're 30 and 3, okay? So if you're good at math, just the number 33. Look at verse 18. These are the sons of Zilpah. Obviously, these are all of the wives of Jacob, right? Each one, it's going through the wives. It's, it's segmenting them in the subcategories and then giving you the offspring, the exact number of offspring from each wife. So here we're on Zilpah. These are the sons of Zilpah. And then it says at the end, verse 18, 16 souls. So we have 33 plus 16. Now look at... Uh, verse number 22. Verse number 22. These are the sons of Rachel, right? Rachel. Look at the end of it. All the souls were 14. Look at verse number 25. Bilhah, the other wife. Uh, concubine, but wife also. Uh, 25. These are the sons of Bilhah. And then it says this. All the souls were 7. You know what that adds up to, all of those numbers? That's 70. You know who's not included there because it's all of his children? Jacob. It's not, it's not speaking of Jacob. Jacob is not added into that number. Jacob is not a part of that 70. It's the 70 that came out of his loins. Just like Exodus 1.5 says, and right here when you add the numbers up. There's no discrepancy. Notice the consistency. <clears throat> Even when the Bible's so meticulous to break down the amount of children from each wife that he had. So the 70 number is the number of his offspring or of his children. And even when you break the numbers down, they add up perfectly. Now, I'll tell you what I think this is. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I don't have a perfect answer, but I'll tell you that this is 100% on the right track. And I'll explain to you why. Look at verse number uh, 26. All the souls that came with Jacob, watch this into Egypt. So who are we counting? Is it just his offspring? Is it just the amount of children that he had? What is it? It's those that went, what? Into Egypt. Notice how the answer is much more simple than you thought. So these are all the souls that went with him where? Into Egypt. Or how many? 66. Right? 66. Now, go over to Exodus 1.5 again. I want you to look at this. Exodus 1.5, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. Now, is that number the number of how many went down into Egypt? No. It's what? It's how many came out of the loins of Jacob. It's just his offspring. 70 is the amount of offspring that he had. That's the 70 number. 66 is a specific number for what? The, his offspring that went into Egypt. Do you understand the difference there? It's his offspring that went into Egypt. Now, I'll tell you... The partial answer. I want you to look at verse number... <coughs> verse number... Where is it at? 12. Look at verse 12. It's of Judah, of course. And the sons of Judah, Ur and Onan, and Shelah and Perez and Zerah... Watch this. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. Are they a part of the 70? Oh, the part of the 70. Yes. They are a part of the 70. Are they a part of the 66? No. Did Ur and Onan go down to Egypt? So people are trying to find this number somewhere else. That's not where it's at. 
The number is actually with who went into Egypt. That's the, that's the true answer. It's not, you know, the Schofield Reference Bible and every other explanation I've ever heard is they're going down the wrong track. The, 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 the answer lies with who went into Egypt. The offspring is the 70. Just how many children he had in general. And then the 66 number is a specific number about how many of his offspring actually went into Egypt. So we have two of them made up now, don't we? So 66, then we have 67, 68, right? Now Jacob, Manasseh, and Ephraim are a part of that 70. But what you could say is this. If you looked at verse number 26, and it would make perfect sense, all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt. So did Joseph go with him into Egypt with Jacob? You know the story, don't you? We, we didn't finish reading it, but Joseph doesn't go. So Jacob's not, or Joseph, I'm sorry, is not included in that number. Either way you slice it, he's not in that number. He didn't go down there with Jacob. He was already there. And I just thought of this. You can further prove that. If you probably, if you read it quite a few times in the book of Exodus, you probably remember. But it says at the end of verse 5, Exodus 1, 5, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So that number 70 actually clarifies in Exodus 1 that, hey, Joseph was already there. That's why he's a part of this 70 and not a part of the 66. Notice how it has to give you that clarification. That's why I'm going to go ahead and add him into this number of his offspring because he was already in Egypt. But he's not added in the 66 number because he didn't go down with Jacob into Egypt. He was already in Egypt. So he wouldn't be added. So everyone in here right now is thinking, we still have 71. Who's thinking that? You know, right? That's Of course, you have Manasseh, Ephraim, and Joseph now at this point. Because when you look at Genesis 46, look at verse number 20. Because he's a part of the 70. Verse number 20, And unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. Now, this is where I don't have the perfect next part of the answer. I'm not exactly sure how to reconcile this, but I'll tell you a possibility. Something very interesting happens when God gives the tribes and their land and he names them in the New Testament. Does anyone notice there's different types of, the, there, there's different groups that are named, different uh, offspring that are named, that are given, that are uh, considered the 12. God will name the 12 tribes and he'll change it up all the time, right? And what does he do with Joseph? This is very interesting. What does he do with Joseph multiple times? He doesn't name it one, the, the 12th as Joseph. What does he do? Or the 11th it would be as Joseph. What does he do? He doesn't name Joseph at all. He just says Manasseh and Ephraim. I mean, that's over and over. Joseph specifically never received... There was no tribe of Joseph. When they, when they went into the land of Canaan, you can look this up and study it in your Bible later if you're not sure about what I'm saying. There was never, hey, this area is the tribe of Joseph, and this land is the land of Joseph. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. He took Joseph and he divided it to Manasseh and Ephraim. And this happens a few different ways when he counts off the 12 tribes of Israel and he names off who the 12 tribes are. He won't even name Joseph. He'll just say Manasseh and Ephraim. And there's never a real good reason that like makes perfect sense to me that I've understood. Of course there is a reason, but that I've understood why. But he just gives that, you know, that double portion it seems like to Joseph, right? And you see some things about Joseph that he's a picture of Christ. You see the promise that's given um, in, we're going to see this in Genesis 49 that seems like he's talking about Christ. So there's some reasons why like on a secondary application, but there's never anything that I've noticed on a primary application. But it happens over and over and over again. Even in the genealogies it happens, where he just goes from Manasseh to Ephraim. So I'm sure everyone knows what I'm getting at now. If you take that number and you just eliminate Joseph, which this may not suffice for you, I'm just giving you a theory, and you just plug in like God does with the, when he counts the 12 tribes. He never just says the tribe of Joseph. But you just insert Ephraim and Manasseh, you could do it that way and you'd come up with your 70. The other theory that, and this is more likely, the other theory is that somebody else died on that list and we don't know who it is. That's the other theory. You're specifically told that Ur and Onan died. 
but you're not told about somebody else, right? So if one other person died, let's just say, I'm just going to pick a poor guy off the list, Esbon. Let's say that Esbon also died, right? Then you could get that number perfectly. That would make sense then. That's, it was just another death, right? That's, what you could, that's how you could add the numbers up. But, you know, so if that doesn't suffice for you, um, you know, maybe you have another theory. Maybe, you know, maybe you can come up with what the correct answer is. I, you know, I'm not sure, but uh, you, could, you could do that with, uh, with Ephraim and Manasseh. That's how God counts up the tribes. He never just says Joseph. He never says, you know, he never goes through all 12 of them and then says Benjamin, Joseph. You know, he just says Ephraim, Manasseh. Benjamin. That's how he does it. So maybe that's how God chose to have it recorded here, and that's why it came up as 70, uh, 70 souls. But either way you slice it, the, the right path to the correct answer is for sure understanding that the 66 number is telling you those that went down to Egypt. Who's missing there are people that did not go down to Egypt. That's who's missing. And the 70 number is the full number of the offspring. The 66 number is the number of those that went down into Egypt. I'm sorry, that, that uh, yeah, that went down into Egypt. And uh, the 70 is the full number of the offspring. So those other four, they just didn't go down into Egypt. That's the only other way that you could, uh, that you could interpret that. There's no other way to interpret it. That's, that's, that is the answer for sure. Uh, so trying to get the numbers to work out correctly. Now here, I will go ahead and do this. This is going to make it even more confusing for you, but I'm gonna go, I'll give you my answer of what I think about this. Go to Acts chapter 7. And you'll note in Stephen's, so you know, Stephen gives like an overview of the Old Testament. Everybody remember that? Stephen just like preaches about the, you know, everything that happened in the Old Testament. He's trying to relate to the Jews and everything. And he's, he's, uh, he's a Jew himself and he's preaching about, he's like our fathers and, and things like that. And he's, he's preaching the gospel unto them. And he's trying to tie in, hey, the God of the Old Testament promised the Messiah and Christ was the Messiah. That's what he's doing. But he, when he gives this, he gives a lot of details about the Old Testament. He says this in, in Acts 7 verse uh, 14. He says this, <clears throat> Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred. Watch this. Three score and fifteen souls. You notice that? Three score and fifteen souls. How many is that? Seventy-five, right? So now we have three numbers. So what do you do there? I think this answer is actually pretty easy. Uh, so what you do is, how many wives did Jacob have? Yeah, he had four. And then you have... Jacob now is included. So now you have five. That would be what makes the most sense to me. I don't see any other way, any other answer that you can interpret it. Uh, but e either way, that's on the right track as well. That would make the most sense. If that's who's left out there is Jacob and then the other four. Go back to Genesis chapter number 46. Genesis chapter number 46. Uh, look at verse number 28. It picks back up in the story here. Verse number 28. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father. So notice he's waiting for him to come. He's excited. You have to think of what a great relationship they had before. And he's missing his father. His father is missing him. You know, it said his spirit revived. I'm sure they're extremely excited. It's a huge city. You could probably see the city from afar. And he's seeing it approaching. And then all of a sudden this chariot starts coming up. Notice what it says. Made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen. And presented himself unto him, and it says, And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Brother Hall pointed out to me that that made an impression on him. And it does. It, it's, it's very interesting. And you can imagine how you know, sentimental this moment was for them. You know, how, you know, how much they missed each other, how much it meant to finally see his father again. We hadn't seen him for you know, 30 years or something crazy, you know, or 20-something years. You know, I'm sure he missed him uh, you know, uh, an extreme amount. And notice what it says that he wept on his neck. It says this, a good while. And it's saying that this went on for quite a while. For a long time, he sat there and was just hugging him and was laying his face on his neck. You know, and he was crying. What well, we would say crying, weeping, right, in the Bible. He, he, this was obviously, uh, you know, a very uh, important moment to both of them. He missed his father very much. I can't imagine not seeing my dad for 20-something years. And he imagines, he thinks that I'm dead. And then, and, and. Having the idea that you're never going to see him again. And then finally, that's what makes it even you know, more so uh, uh, powerful, uh, is that you think that you're never going to see him again. Probably never going to see him again. 
And then you finally get to see him again. Notice what it says in verse 30. And Israel said unto Joseph, Let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. Now, in the past chapters, I've been uh, using a lot of, uh, of symbolism and tying in uh, Joseph with Jesus. And, and obviously, uh, this ties in with the resurrection, of course, now that Joseph is alive, right? And, and uh, just like Jesus was dead, people are wondering, we thought that he was the Christ, what? And then he raises again from the dead. He actually is alive. And, and when they brought the message to tell uh, Jacob that, that Joseph was alive, it's like when we go out and bring the, the message to tell people, hey, Jesus is alive, right? So we can see the symbolism still, as I pointed out in the last chapter. We can see that still carrying over and spilling over into this chapter as well. But there's something very interesting as well to me that, that about this uh, uh, particular story right here where Jacob says this to Joseph. He says, now that I've seen you, I can die. This actually happens with someone with Christ. Simeon. Who's, you remember there's the woman, Anna the prophetess. She's in the temple night and day. She's a widow you know, uh, for, for a very long time. And uh, there was another man, Simeon, who would go into the temple. And he was it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that before he died, he would see the salvation of the Lord. And when the Christ, when Jesus is brought to the temple and he sees him, he actually makes a very similar statement. That now he can die. Now that I've seen you, right? So it's a picture, of course, this is a picture of Simeon seeing the Christ. Seeing the salvation of the Lord. And Joseph in this way was used to bring salvation to them. A physical salvation nonetheless, but a salvation to the people of Israel. Just like Jesus will save his people from their sins, he saw, Simeon that is, saw the salvation of Israel as well. And then he died, just like uh, Jacob makes that similar statement here. Look at verse 31. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, my brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. Now a lot of people are confused with the word cattle and they think that it just refers to cows. It refers to any type of, of, of a herd of animal. And you can prove here that even sheep are referred to as cattle. So that's a good place if that confused you before. I've had that conversation with a few other people. You can see here that they're shepherds. It says, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. That's to feed sheep, right? Look at uh, verse 33. <clears throat> uh, and it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, what is your occupation? That, sh that ye shall say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth, even until now. Both we and also our fathers, that, ye, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. So notice they're going to dwell in a separate land, in the land of Goshen. This is where they end up living out the entire time that they live in the land of Egypt, is this little suburb, if you will, of Egypt, Goshen. Then it says this, it's real interesting. I'll make an application of this and then we'll be done for the evening. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Now, what does Egypt represent? The world, right? What is a shepherd in the Bible? What is a shepherd? The shepherd and bishop of your souls. What is that? It's Jesus, what is he? It's talking about the pastor and bishop of your soul. So what is a shepherd? And, and you're actually called, they're actually, the word pastor means shepherd. And when he's talking to a pastor in the Old Testament, he'll say, woe unto the shepherds of my flock. That's not a literal shepherd. He's talking about a pastor. And Egypt represents what? The world. Now look at that statement. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that true? How many hit pieces have you seen on CNN and stuff where they're just mocking and trying to make fun of independent fundamental Baptist pastors and shepherds? The world hates, hates pastors of God's Word. They hate pastors of God. Just the other day I saw on, uh, on uh, Anderson Cooper they were mocking and making fun of some, he was a, I looked him up, he's a Baptist, I think he's a Southern Baptist pastor in North Carolina. They're constantly wanting to mock and make fun of shepherds and the pastors of God's Word. That would stand up. And what makes them angry, of course they, you know, they hate that the pastor stands up and sheds light. Just like Jesus went around preaching the Word of God. They hate that the pastor stands up and sheds light on their wicked deeds. That's what they hate. That's why they hated Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Right? When, when, when a shepherd is loved by the Egyptians or he's loved by the world, he's not an abomination, then there's a problem. 
Like Jesus said about the Pharisees, and he was specifically talking about them, who were the false spiritual leaders, he said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. When there's a shepherd or a pastor that is loved by the world, Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar, you can go through the list of all these heretics, Joyce Meyer, right? Go through the list of all these different uh, you know, shepherds, Billy Graham, even Baptists, independent fundamental Baptists will be like, Billy Graham was a man of God. When you find a pastor that the world loves, that is not a real preacher. That is not a real shepherd. That is not a real pastor. That's why Jesus said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. You say, give me a proof text. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. When the whole world loves you, there's something wrong with what you're preaching. You know why? Because the pastor and the shepherd is told, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. The majority of what a pastor is supposed to do is stand up and preach the word of God, and most of it's negative. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. One-third of that is positive, two-thirds of that is negative. You know why? how the world and the Egyptians end up loving a pastor and loving a shepherd? When he stands up and he just preaches good things. When he just preaches everything positive when I say good things. Obviously, everything in the Word of God is good when we speak morally and what's right, right? I'm talking about things that, that, that you know, tickle their ears, right? Because, you know, Paul goes on to say, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. So notice that they're going to they're gonna heap unto themselves. They're going to have all these different pastors and shepherds. They're going to just preach to them the things that they want. Do you think those shepherds are going to be loved by the world? If you show me a pastor, I don't care who it is. I don't care if you like him. You did, it doesn't matter. If you show me a pastor that the world loves, that is a false teacher. That is a false pastor. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. Now, maybe he's preaching a co compromised message. Well, then he falls into the minority. But almost every single... I'm saying maybe he's saved and he's just preaching a compromised message, just to clarify. Now, almost every single you know, pastor that is loved by the world, they all preach a false, false gospel. Every last one of them. Every single one of them. It is just a fact that true pastors and true shepherds are an abomination unto the Egyptians. True pastors and true shepherds are an abomination to the world. They will not ever be loved by the world. So if you want to be a pastor and you have this attitude where you just want to be a people pleaser, then it's not the right job for you. Because you better get used to people not liking you and being an abomination to other people. And it's not just, hey, I just don't like what you say, they hate you. They, th the world does not like you. The world, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Go to John 15 and we'll look at this passage. When he's speaking unto the spiritual leaders, which are the disciples, Jesus, I want you to notice what he says to them. In John chapter number 15. John chapter number 15. Look at... Uh, verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. Look at verse 18. If the world hate you, you ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, what, what is uh, in John 10, what is Jesus called? Does anybody remember what that chapter is? The Good Shepherd. It's the chapter about Jesus being the Good Shepherd. What's that talking about? Him being the Good Pastor. Who is the best pastor ever? Jesus. Did the world love him? The world hated him. They took him and killed him. They took him and crucified him. They hated him. The world hated him. The Egyptians hated him. He was a, they, you know, Jesus was an abomination unto them, right? And he says, he says this, he tells his, his disciples that preachers, these are going to be pastors, they're going to be you know, bishops, the office of an apostle is a bishopric, right? They're pastors. Remember he tells Peter, you know, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He makes the statement if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you show me a Jesus where they trim the message and, and everybody just loves this Jesus, that's not, that's not the right Jesus. They're worshiping the wrong Jesus. They've created this Jesus in their mind where they've cut out all the negative. You can't just, you know, you know uh, just, just pick and choose what you want about Jesus. You either have him all or you don't have him at all. You either have the right Jesus with all of it or you don't have him at all, right? And that's what people do today is they've created this other Jesus, this other type of Jesus 
where it's just the positive things that Jesus preaches. It's just the positive things that Jesus preached, right? And then that's why you'll hear people say, if you say anything negative, they're like, that's not very Christ-like of you. Jesus said, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. He tells his disciples, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. It's, it actually shows that if there's a pastor, a shepherd, that is hated by the world, that proves that he's following Christ. Amen. That shows, hey, this guy's a, a good pastor. Jesus was the good shepherd, right? And the good shepherd was hated by the world so much that he was killed. So if, if, if I, as the pastor of this church, end up being hated by the world, end up being hated by the Egyptians, a lot of people would say, that guy's not a true pastor. Then, pe the, then people would love him. He's supposed to be preaching a message of love. You know, he's preaching a message of hate, right? This is the kind of things that they would say. They'd say people would love him and accept him. You know, if he was a good pastor, he would be liked. They would look at Joel Osteen because he's accepted by the majority and liked by the world, and they'd say, that's a real pastor, wouldn't they? No, that actually proves that he's not following Christ. And if a man that is hated by the world, that proves he's he is following Christ and that Joel Osteen's not following Christ. If you're loved by the world, if, if you're loved by the Egyptians, if you're a shepherd that the Egyptians love, well, then you're a false shepherd, my friend. You're either unsaved and a false shepherd, or you're teaching things that false shepherds teach just to get a big crowd, just to, for filthy lucre, because you're not interested in the Word of God. A true shepherd is going to preach the Word instant and be instant in season and out of season. Instant means, you know, immediately. You're going you're to be ready to do it at any time. In season, out of season. I'm going to preach messages when they're popular and when they're not. You know, when maybe you're not in the mood for something, I'm going to preach it anyways. When you are in the mood for it, well, I'll preach it that day too, right? You know, there's going to be things that, let's say this, let's use this application, in season, out of season. When something is out of season in the world, because culture is constantly changing. The United States of America, what they accept and what they like changes every year. All the time, so quick. But guess what? When they like it, I'm going to preach it. When they don't like it, I'm going to preach it. And I don't care if they like me, I don't care if they don't like me. And you know what? When they don't like me, that just proves I'm following Christ. That, you know, that if, if I'm preaching the Word of God and they don't like me, I can point and show you and I would say, hey, that makes perfect sense. You'll know that they hated me before they hated you, right? Keep reading. What's it say next? Uh, I think there's two more verses or one more verse where he talks about this. Look at verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. You know what that shows about these false preachers and false pastors? They're of the world. You're of the world. That's why the world loves you because you're of, you're of them. They love their own. If they don't love a pastor... If the, if the world just hates you, if CNN just despises you, right? If there's just like, just the world in general, those that epitomizes the world's opinions, the media or something, right? Do you think that if, the, you know, that if, let's say, I don't even know the local Jacksonville news, do you think that if somebody sent them a, a thing of like the recording of maybe the sermon that I did on Genesis 19, do you think that they would like that? Of course not. Do you think that the majority would like that? No, they would not like that, right? Now, would that come out of like Joel Osteen's mouth or something like that? What's the, what's the reason why? Because he's not following Christ. He's not truly preaching the Bible. He's not a true disciple of the Bible. And you can tell that a pastor that is preaching the Bible, he is, you can just put it in the bank that the world will always hate them. The world will always hate a true shepherd, a shepherd that is following the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because they hated the Lord Jesus Christ. And shepherds, like it says here, isn't that interesting? It ends with that. He basically already explained it, but he says, and go back to Genesis 46. He ends with this, this, this interesting statement. It says, For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. The Egyptians, Egypt is a consistent picture of the world over and over and over again in the Bible. And what is a shepherd? It's a pastor. Every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. If people start like, if we start getting kicked out of where we're, where we're at, and people start hating us and stuff, that can be discouraging sometimes. Because we're human beings. Right? 
You know, when people are just like saying bad, when the whole world is against you, you know, it can be hard to stand up and you start questioning what you're doing, right? Like when all of us and all that happened in Arizona, I'm sure everybody, I even did, right? I started like thinking like, man, am I wrong about this? When everybody's against you, it's real easy to start questioning whether or not you're right about something. It's real easy to start wondering like, maybe, I, maybe the world's right and I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. And I, when, when many people are gathered up to you, it makes you question yourself sometimes. When, you know, the world gets against you and they start speaking negatively about you and you're just hearing it from the left, from the right. If we go under fire, and, which I'm sure we will eventually, but we start receiving heat like that, it can be discouraging and be prepared for that. Really, honestly, you're going to remember this sermon. I'm going to remind you of it when it happens. You know, remember that I said this and remember that idea. Yet, that doesn't mean because they hate you that you're wrong. No, no, no. That, would, that makes perfect sense that you're on the right side. Obviously, we affirm that we're on the right side by the Word of God. Because, hey, can people hate you, you know, for something that you preach that's not in the Bible? It's possible, right? But when you preach things that are in the Bible, like Jesus did, He spoke the Word of God, He was God, the world hates the Good Shepherd. Hated the Good Shepherd and still hates Him today. The real Good Shepherd. When they hear the words of Jesus, they hate the words where He's, he's preaching hard and preaching negative things, right? They hate that. So, you need to expect the world to be against us. You need to expect, if you want to be a pastor, if you want to be a preacher even, right? You need to expect to be hated by the world. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. There's actually a problem when the whole world loves you. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. That's an issue. That's a problem. That just shows you're trimming the... It's hard to get this whole world to agree with you. You have to be just preaching on... You have to be treading so lightly and preaching on such a limited amount of things that just everybody agrees with, right? Just, just these few little things that you know that won't step on any toes, right? So don't be surprised when, you know, we get added to the, the Southern Poverty Law Center's list of, you know, the hate groups and, you know, I'm sure that that moment will come. You know, I'm sure that Jacksonville News will say things about us. I'm sure that they will. You expect that to happen, right? You expect to be hated by the world. Why? For every, every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. Dear Lord, we thank you.